Okay, next up we have Derek Macklin from Stanford University. His field is computational and systems biology. Uh, his advisor is Marcus Covert, and he did his practicum at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in 2014. Thanks, Adam. All right, uh, so today I would like to share with all of you a question that I find fascinating, and that is how does a cell work? More specifically, how does a bacterial cell work? For a moment, just observe. Look at them grow and divide. I find it hypnotizing still. You know, they can reproduce in the time slot allocated to this talk. These microorganisms are incredible, and they're incredibly complex. How do they work? That is, in broad strokes, the question that my dissertation will in some sense try to answer, at least once I start writing. Um, and so, when you have this question, what is the best way to answer it? I would argue that the best way to answer the question of how does something work is with a model, in particular, a computational model. And I'm not alone in this thinking. Clyde Hutchison, a scientist from the Venter Institute, has said, the ultimate test of understanding a simple cell more than being able to build one would be to build a computer model of the cell because that really requires understanding at a deeper level. And an added benefit of building a computational model is that it allows me, a computer nerd, to be able to go to a bar and tell people that I model for a living. Um, so to set the stage for our work, back in 2012 when I first started this fellowship, my lab mates and I uh, released a gene-complete model of Mycoplasma genitalium. This is a model that incorporates the function of every annotated gene in the cell. Here's some of its output. And man, I wish I had a projector this big in lab. Um, on the uh, top, well, on the top, well, okay, won't use the pointer. Top left panel, what you see is we are dynamically uh, computing the expression of every gene in the cell over its life cycle. In fact, we keep track of every single molecule in the cell, and as far as I'm aware, uh, we are the only research group uh, in the field crazy enough to do that. In the top right panel, what you see is the cell shape as it grows and divides. In the bottom left panel, you see the circular chromosomes in the cell, uh, and you see the nuclear, or, sorry, you see the proteins that are bound to them at nucleotide level resolution. And then in this final fourth panel on the bottom right, you see the metabolic reactions in the cell and how they vary to meet the cell's energetic needs. What's incredible is that this all comes from one single internally consistent model, in fact, from one simulation. Okay, and so, uh, sorry, what we want to do, um, a little bit more about this organism. So we're modeling Mycoplasma genitalium. And if you want, sorry, if you want to uh, see more of this, you can go to wholesalevis.org and just, you know, not everyone at once, because we just got the cheap hosting plan. Um, but uh, to tell you a little bit more about this bug, um, as you might guess from the name, Mycoplasma uh, genitalium is a urogenital pathogen, but its claim to fame is that it's the smallest known self-replicating organism that you can grow in a lab. It has only 525 genes. Its genome is just under 600 kilobases, uh, and it's three to 500 nanometers in diameter, so small that for a while people actually thought it was a virus. And so it makes sense that this was selected for the first gene-complete model of a cell. It's sort of the most tractable thing you can do. Uh, but it didn't make sense to go with going forward. Um, in particular, uh, mycoplasma grows very slowly. Um, it is, uh, since it's a pathogen, you have to uh, have a BSL-2 uh, lab space, which not all labs have access to. Um, it's so small, it's 300 to 500 nanometers in diameter, it's so small that you can't see it under uh, the light microscope, and it's hard to genetically manipulate or perturb. So it's hard to do experiments with this bug, and uh, as a result, it's hard to um, test, benchmark, and refine our models. And we need to do this because, if you can take it from me, our models, while the output may look impressive, they're still far from perfect. So we need to work in an organism that's experimentally tractable. And so at this point, what we did, being at Stanford in the heart of Silicon Valley, we did what any self-respecting Silicon Valley entity would do. We pivoted. Uh, we switched from modeling Mycoplasma genitalium 
uh, to modeling E. coli. E. coli has over 60 years of data published on it. And it's so easy to work with experimentally that even I can do experiments with it. So anyone else in this room can too with just a little bit of training. So this all sounds great, but Derek, where's, where's the E. coli whole cell model? Uh, unfortunately, it's not that easy. E. coli has 10 times more genes and 50 times more molecules than M. genitalium. Fortunately, I have CSGF. You know, not only is there just more stuff, there's more physiology, 10 times more physiology. And some of it's really interesting, but there's a lot of it. E. coli, certainly compared to mycoplasma, really responds dynamically to its environment. Um, and so we have to incorporate that. So what are the real, you know, challenges that we face uh, in this space? Um, one thing that I've noticed from coming to these program reviews is that my colleagues in other disciplines, you often start with the governing equations for your system and then work from there. In biology, we simply do not have quantitative governing equations of a cell. In fact, that's what this work is trying to pinpoint or at least approximate to some, some degree. Uh, the other big challenge that we have is data. Um, from the simulation output that I showed you guys, uh, you see that um, we're trying to simulate individual cells dynamically over the cell cycle. Unfortunately, most of the data that's published out there is static. It's collected at one time point, um, and it is population averaged over many cells. So I refer, I refer to this problem as sort of data sparsity. We kind of lack the, the data that, that we really want. Um, and the other problem is that when we do have data out there, it's often the case that when two groups measure the same things, uh, the values that they report will differ a lot. And so I refer to this as variability or inconsistency. And I have a concrete example of this. When we were building the mycoplasma model, one of the things we needed to know was how much DNA is there in the cell. We wanted to know um, the, is this not showing up? What happened here? Uh, okay, I'll just talk through it. Um, we want to know the DNA mass in the cell. And so what happened was there was one group in the 1960s that reported a biochemical measurement that they did. They directly, you know, what they did is they grew up some cells, they uh, lysed them, they isolated the DNA, and then you can just sort of like weigh how much is there. And from their measurement, uh, they calculated that there were, um, there was 0.2 femtograms of DNA in the cell. So that's 10 to the minus 15 grams. Uh, a few decades later, we have uh, the um, genome sequence. So we have all the A's, T's, C's, and G's. And knowing the molecular masses of each of these species, uh, we can compute the mass of the chromosome. And from this, you, ca you get an answer of 0.9 femtograms. And so you have 0.2 on one hand, and you have 0.9 on the other. So that's a factor of nearly five-fold difference. And this is, you know, for something that should be very simple to measure. It's often the case that when I go through the literature looking for parameters, I'll often see numbers that differ by an order of magnitude. Um, and so how do we grapple with this um, and build a whole cell model in this context? And so what we do to start is you take a list of E. coli's 4,500 genes and you want to group them into biological processes. This took me and my lab mate, Nick Ruggiero, uh, the good part of a month to do full-time effort. Once you do that, you end up with a figure that looks like this, um, with about 50 processes in all. And you'll see some things here that you might recognize uh, from a high school biology textbook as well as some other more esoteric processes. Okay, great. What then? Um, what you see in this figure is actually two things. Uh, the first, actually most tangibly, is probably the cell state, the things, the physical entities, the molecules and the macromolecules that make up the cell. And then on top of that, you see the biological processes that link them together. They're sort of the arrows in this figure. And so we can abstract that one step further. And what we'll see is uh, we can have a really, um, this is great. OK. What we'll have is something that looks like you know, an ODE integrator. Well, we'll have our state vectors on one side and our processes on another. Um, and so, you know, what we do is we start with an initial cell state and then we iterate, you know, we start with the initial cell state, we send that to the processes, they perform some computation and then uh, feedback on the cell state and this just updates. 
Uh, the thing is, it's a little more complicated than that. So we have this diagram here that looks a lot like an ODE integrator, which uh, many people will be familiar with. We have our uh, state vector on one side, the biological process is on the other. And we run this in a loop until the cell divides. And you know, as I said, first pass, this looks like an ODE integrator, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because, as I mentioned, we have this problem of biological sparsity. We have this spectrum um, where we have, there are biological processes we know a lot about, there are processes we know little about. And processes we know a lot about, we can model using stochastic simulations. Uh, processes we know little about, we might just need to use Boolean models with simple on-off rules. And for things in between, um, we might use ODE models or constraint-based models, and you could put PDE models up on the right somewhere here uh, as well, too. Um, and so if you return to this figure, this processes box up here is really an amalgam of different mathematical submodels, uh, one for each process, depending on you know, how much we know about that biological process. And for this to work, um, what we have to do is we have to make a critical assumption that we can uh, model these processes independently over a short time scale and then merge their outputs over a long time scale. And you might imagine that as a result of having this mathematical amalgam over here and this assumption that these arrows are actually quite complex and have a lot of subtleties and a lot of nuance, and you'd be right. And those arrows and ones not even shown here are where I have to spend the bulk of my time to actually make sure that these things work. And unfortunately, with the time allotted, especially with these technical difficulties, um, I don't have time to go into the details of that. But if you're interested in how that works, please come find me after. And I think we could have some really interesting discussions. What I want to do in the remaining time is show you some unpublished results that I'm really excited about. They're going to be, come, be coming out soon because uh, I need to graduate. Um, the first one, we're going to look at the cell composition. Uh, we're going to look at the protein, RNA, and DNA mass in the cell. And what we notice is that these all double over the cell cycle with different dynamics. It's actually not trivial to find a set of parameters which results in that behavior. And what's nice is that this is relatively stable over many generations. And one thing I want to point out is that this plot was not possible to make with our version 1 mycoplasma simulations. Thanks to the CSGF training, our E. coli simulations uh, run, which have, you know, again, 50 times more molecules, they run in 10 minutes per generation compared to our mycoplasma simulations, which took about 10 hours. That gain in speed allowed us to have a test debug cycle, which gave us, you know, enabled us to get this sort of stability. So this was really cool and would not have been possible without this work or this fellowship. Uh, the next thing I want to show you is something that, you know, I've, I've worked a lot on the last, during the last year. Um, and it's a little more involved, but we'll walk through it. I think it's really cool. Um, and so remember that I said that E. coli behaves very dynamically. And so this is physiology that did not exist in our mycoplasma simulations. And so what I'm showing you in the top panel here is that we add a stimulus molecule to the cell partway through its cell cycle. And what we see, you know, this, is, this happens to be a nutrient. And so in our mycoplasma simulations, this would be the only panel that I'd show you on this screen. There'd be nothing else to show. Uh, but in E. coli, there's a protein which detects it, senses it, and transitions to its active form. As a result of becoming active, this sensing protein, which is also known as a transcription factor, it will bind to a DNA target site more frequently. What you're seeing in the blue up here is that it's either bound or not bound um, to a particular target site. Uh, but then on average, which is shown in orange, it will be bound more frequently uh, when it's active. And following that, as a result of being active, it will result in decreased synthesis of a target gene, um, which again we see here with this stochasticity. Now as a result, that target gene will get diluted out over the cell cycle, and this will have physiological and energetic implications for the cell. And what I want to point out is that um, my advisor during his PhD tried to model s systems very similar to this, but at the time, due to the data that was available, it was only Boolean on-off models. There were no numbers you know, on any of the y-axes here. And so due to work that I've done with my lab mate Javier Carrera over the last year, and he's done a lot of the legwork on this, we actually have numbers for over 50 of these systems which we're implementing right now. And so that's really cool. This is like a big advance, capital B, capital A in the field. Um, 
And so uh, going forward, uh, where's this field headed? Um, I started with the question of, you know, how does a cell work? Uh, as we refine these models, we'll be able to answer that question better. What then? I think we'll be able to use these models at some point to rationally engineer biological organisms for useful purposes. Things like biofuel production, uh, carbon storage, contaminant bioremediation, you know, things that the DOE cares about. In addition, um, there'll be other applications, medical applications that other three letter agencies and pharma companies would be interested in as well. Uh, I think the real rate limiting step to getting to these applications, the thing that's holding us back right now is the data. As I, as I showed you, we have this problem of data inconsistency in the literature, but as we have experimentalists and computational science working more closely together, uh, we'll be able um, you know, to progress this technology, things will get better, and we're gonna have some really exciting developments come out of this. Um, and then the most important part of the talk, the acknowledgements. Um, I need to uh, thank my lab mates. I've worked with nearly a dozen people on this project and I've learned a lot from all of them. In particular, I should thank my advisor, Marcus Covert, uh, who is phenomenal. Um, I also wanna thank everyone involved with making this fellowship a reality. I realize it's an incredible amount of work. Everyone from the program managers at DOE, uh, to the staff at Krell, practicum coordinators and supervisors, um, university coordinators, everyone, thank you for everything that you do. This work wouldn't have been possible otherwise. I've had some other funding throughout grad school as well, and uh, happy to take questions.